Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning back into PACU Nursing Minutes. Today, we're going to talk about epidural and spinal blocks. I forgot to mention this during uh, the local regional anesthesia, uh, but I want to mention it here. And it's very um, important because you cannot do a block on somebody who's had trauma. And the reason why you can't do a block, a spinal um, or a regional block is because you would miss compartment syndrome. And so that's very important to understand that concept. Uh, they unfortunately will have to just go through a general anesthesia for their surgery if they have any fractures at ORIF. They're not candidates for spinals. Uh, let's say they have a femur fracture or a tibial fracture. Um, they can't get a block and they can't have a spinal. So because of the inability to identify compartment syndrome early on. So the epidural block is when the anesthesiologist places a catheter into the epidural space. And there an anesthetic is delivered continuously and it is causing blockade to the nerves as they exit the subarachnoid space. This is a continuous catheter infusion of an anesthetic. This can be used in the thoracic region. It can be used in the lumbar region. It is a gradual onset, so less profound effects than what you see with a spinal anesthesia, but you still can have hypotension. And there are some things to be um, aware of with your epidurals. One, confirming catheter placement, location, depth, securement, uh, assessing for a hematoma immediately upon arrival to pack you if it was placed in the OR. Uh, if they're placing it post-op, you can go back and watch the other video about assisting anesthesia for doing block placement. Epidurals are great. They can infuse anesthetic for several days, giving significant amount of pain management coverage. And this is actually recommended with the enhanced recovery after surgery pathways as you delve into those pathways. And you'll see that it's used widely with the lumbar and thoracic surgeries. Now, the next neuroaxial block that we are going to talk about is the spinal. And this is a single injection done usually around the level of L3, L4 uh, into the subarachnoid space. And this is usually done for your elective orthopedic surgeries like a hip replacement or a knee replacement. There is a rapid onset of this because it's blocking the autonomic response. So there's hypotension, vasodilation, relaxation, uh, temperature regulation is a concern because they can't vasoconstrict. Hypotension, as I said, is a concern um, because now they're vasodilated. Phenylephrine is usually the drug of choice to manage that uh, hypotension, but spinals have had a very good success in uh, managing post-op pain. Uh, the patients actually can be even awake during their surgery with the spinal. When the patient is being recovered, this is when you need to be aware of your dermatones and you're gonna be assessing the levels of the epidural effect and the spinal effect. What you want to see is a progression down through the dermatome level. This is a grid of our dermatones. Most of our patients come out somewhere around T12 level, L1, and what you wanna see is a gradual progression down below that level. And how you assess for it is several ways. You could use a blunt needle, the tip of the needle. Um, it's blunt, so you're not gonna cause a puncture, but you can rub against their skin for them to have that sensation. Or you could fill a glove with ice and use that for your sensory test. Or you could just use your gloved hand uh, for a sensory test, just lightly um, a gentle, pinch of the skin. And I, like I said, gentle, you're not pinching where you would leave a mark or anything, um, but it is a light touch. So, and you're going to gradually assess those dermatone levels. Uh, the spinal anesthesia wears off slowly, anywhere from two to four hours. So I usually assess my dermatones every 30 minutes to 60 minutes. I would recommend that you follow your hospital's policy procedures for your spinal assessments. Um, when you are documenting it, you do want to document what type of um, tool did you use? Was it a cold glove? Was it a light touch? Was it a blunt needle um, in that assessment? And like I said, it's slow, but every 30 to 60 minutes, you need to be assessing it. So here I have a grid showing you the loss 
of autonomic response and sensation and movement. So we first start off with the autonomic loss. So remember I talked about the vasodilation, the lack of the ability to vasoconstrict, temperature, uh, the ability to sense hot and cold is next, uh, then pain, the nociceptors are now saturated, um, those nerve roots, and then touch, and then movement, and then proprioception, that is the awareness of where your body is. Um, like if you have your legs crossed, you would know that, but that will that is proprioception. So they wouldn't realize if their legs were bent in an awkward position. Now we need to remember that when the sensation and motor movement return, it all returns in the reverse order in which they lost function. Therefore proprioception, then movement, then the sensation of touch, then pain, then temperature, and then resumption of autonomic function, blood pressure control, bladder function. Oh, on average, I can tell you that some people will regain motor function more on one side than the other side, sensation faster on one side than the other side. It's not abnormal. It's actually very common. What you want to just note is that they are regressing in their dermatone level and it is going down um, and wearing off and that they are getting movement back. They are getting sensation back. So one of the things that I find valuable is I ask the patient if they can actually contract their quad, like do an isometric contraction. I'll get that isometric contraction back well before I get a plantar flexion and a dorsiflexion with their feet. Um, so that's just a, a tip that I picked up from an anesthesiologist uh, early on and I've adopted it ever since. So I, um, you know, I assess them for sensation uh, at each dermatone level on each side. And then I ask them if they can just think about contracting their thigh. And it's surprising how many of them do have some uh, flicker of muscle contraction return. And then as it continues to wear off, it'll be more and more and more um, where it'd be like a gross motor movement and then more fine motor where the dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, et cetera. And then they can begin moving their legs. Um, when you are assessing your patient's ability to get out of bed, they need to be able to march in place before they walk. So that's one way of testing um, motor movement and function and sensation before you actually ambulate the patient. And that's important with our same day knee, place, knee replacements and same day hip replacement surgery patient population. So as you are assessing your patient's ability to leave the recovery room when they've had a spinal or an epidural, um, the very first things that you're going to be assessing again is you wanna make sure you have regression of your spinal. Um, several dermatones. Again, follow your hospital's policy and procedure for that. I have seen very strict policies where they have to have motor movement back before they're allowed to be discharged. And I've seen very lenient policies where if they're below L1 or T12, then they release them. So, um, and they're not hypotensive. So like I said, get to know your hospital's policy and procedures. You do wanna make sure that their blood pressure is stable because remember that autonomic function is the last thing to return. And many of these patients are hypotensive. And so you will be managing that in the recovery room. You know, make sure that you've maintained euvolemia with these patients as well. You also wanna assess the um, spinal injection site. You also wanna assess the epidural site for a hematoma. If either of those are there, you're immediately reporting that. And then you want to make sure that you are maintaining normothermia because remember, they have a lack of ability to vasoconstrict, so they will lose passive body heat because they can't do that. So whenever I know that I've got a total joint coming out of the OR, I just go ahead and pre-warm my bear hugger and I get several warm blankets. So I'm all ready to handle that issue because sometimes they're rigoring pretty significantly. And you can usually manage this with just surface warming instead of going to drugs. Stay tuned, I'm gonna have an episode on rigors coming out shortly. Now next, you're gonna to wanna to assess for your patient's ability to sit up without hypotension. So once their spinal has regressed several levels, I begin sitting them up gradually 
and watching their blood pressure. It also helps the progression of the spinal to wear off to just slightly give them a little incline. I think gravity helps with that significantly. And then urinary retention. A lot of our patients are not getting catheterized anymore um, because of the incidence of cauties. So uh, you'll see the ERAS protocols have moved away from that. So you do want to get out your bladder scanner and assess their bladder retention and then follow your hospital's policy and procedures to empty their bladder. Remember that bladder retention causes hypertension. So if they're retaining and you have high blood pressure, think about their urinary status. When was the last time they voided? And just get that scanner out real quick. And, uh, you know, if they meet your protocol to cath, don't hesitate to go ahead and straight cath. It's pretty common in this patient population that we have to do it at least once post-op before they have the ability to regain their bladder function while that spinal wears off. And then also be assessing for a headache because there could be a dural tear that um, can be discovered. So you just want to keep that in your thoughts of your critical thinking. If they all of a sudden, you know, have a headache when you begin to sit them up, you'll want to notify your anesthesiologist of that. After you've addressed all those things and their spinal is wearing down, meet your hospital's policy and procedure, then they are ready to be discharged. And with the epidurals, if their pain is managed, their site is intact and clean and dry, their catheter is intact and no dislodgement, and their pain is under control and they, their vital signs are all stable, their blood pressure, then they're ready to be transferred out of the PACU into the floor. Stay tuned as we talk about opioids. Here are my references. Thank you for tuning in to PACU Nursing Minutes. I'm Nurse Kathy.